Good morning again, everyone. Uh, the second talk this morning will be by Matt Kerr from uh, Washington University in St. Louis on differential equations and mixed Hodge structures. Matt. Thanks, Philip. It's a, it's a pleasure to speak here in, in Miami, where I understand it's, it's much warmer than where I am. Um, and this actually, this talk goes back to some work with Philip and Mark Green that we did almost 15 years ago now. And since then, I've been interested in uh, arithmetic features of pure and mixed period maps, like the ones discussed by Jacob in the last talk, at the boundary, in the asymptotic sense of Schmidt's limiting mixed Hodge structure that was uh, discussed by Christian yesterday uh, from a different point of view. And what I'm what my objective is in this talk is to examine limiting mixed Hodge structures and other features, asymptotic features of period maps from the point of view of the motivic gamma program that was initiated in recent work by Goloshev and Zagier on the one hand and Bloch and Blasenko on the other. One thing that you get out of this is um, sort of a demystification of the relationship between uh, zeta values and limiting mixed Hodge structures by decoupling that part of the story from mirror symmetry. Um, so let me begin, uh, let me go through what's written on the slides. So Goloshev and Zagier proved something called the gamma conjecture for rank one fan of three folds. And uh, that uh, the, the main tool that they used to do that was to study certain Frobenius solutions to the regularized quantum differential equations of these phantoms. Um, and they used the monodromy of these solutions to define Frobenius constants, kappa naught through kappa three, and matched these to coefficients of powers of the first churn class in the regularized gamma hat class of the Fano. That's the, that's the content of the conjecture in that case. So attached to the Fano is a variation of Hodge structure over a Zariski open in D1 arising from its Landau Gensberg model. And Bloch and Blasenko then interpreted these constants as periods of the limiting mixed Hodge structure of variation at the origin, and also interpreted their extension to an infinite sequence as limiting mixed Hodge structure of certain mixed period maps arising from unipotent extensions. Um, and the generating series kappa of these Frobenius constants, they proved, and this is sort of their main theorem, uh, constitute a period of a motivic Mellon transform, as they so as they call it, or a motivic gamma function attached to the variation. Uh, the motivic simply means that the variation they started with comes from geometry. And in a preprint earlier this year. I showed how to describe the first unipotent extensions in their article motivically. Um, and in a follow up preprint with Goloshev and Tokyo Sasaki, uh, I, who's a, a postdoc there in Miami, um, we looked at limiting ratios of normalized solutions to the quantum recurrence of the Fano. They're called Apiary constants. These are different from the Frobenius constants. And they have a, a different mixed Hodge theoretic interpretation as well, which is associated closely to algebraic cycles. And that's what we do in that preprint. Um, and I'm going to sort of, as I said, decouple this completely from mirror symmetry and the context in which it arose originally and just present it as an entirely B model Hodge theoretic story. Um, and you get closed form proofs of a lot of interesting facts about limiting mixed hot structures. So to set things up, I'm going to be very constrained to simplify things. Um, Block and Vlasenko and my paper treat more general cases, um, at least slightly more general cases than what I'll do now. I don't want to split hairs now. So start with a smooth projective n plus one fold fibered out over the projective line. And this fibering is smooth over a Zariski open, in which I'll choose a point near the origin, P. And there will be a coordinate T on this projective line. 
So that's what I mean when I say near zero, near t equals zero. The discriminant locus is going to be called sigma. That's the complement of u. And here's a little picture of the discriminant locus together with the point p. And I always assume that zero and infinity, I sort of include them in the discriminant locus. Um, the other points of the discriminant locus are called sigma cross. And there's going to be one um, choice of a point there that is closest to the origin. That's an assumption that I'll make. And that will be called C. Um, so now I take a sub variation of the nth fiber wise cohomology. And uh, I, I can write it as a D module with the Gauss Monian connection and write L for the Picard Fuchs operator. Um, I will write FK for the Hodge flag inside M and blackboard M for the Q local system coming from the RNF lower star of Q. And the polarizing form will just come from fiberwise integration or intersection. And the reason why I want to take a sub variation of Hodge structure is just so that I can treat some cases that go beyond assuming the fibers are strictly Calabi Yau. But I do want the variation to be of Calabi Yau type with all Hodge numbers one. So these are one, 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 one variations. And that's all I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to assume that I have a canonical maximal unipotent monodromy point at, at t equals zero. And so that means that the monodromy invariance, the invariance under t naught, um, uh, have rank one. So I always measure the q Betty part of the uh, cohomology or homology. So it's cohomology if it's blackboard M, homology if it's blackboard M dual. I always measure it at P so that I have a smooth fiber to measure it from. So I'm saying that the invariants going about here have rank one. And I write epsilon naught for a generator of the sort of invariant part of the homology. I do homology because I want to integrate against it. And I also assume that the rank of the image of the monodromy about each of these points is one, and that the fibers there have only ordinary double point singularities. And so that implies I have what's called conifold monodromy at each of the points in sigma cross. Um, and finally, I assume that the rank of uh, the sort of common invariance of T naught and TC uh, are zero. So that means that if I take the invariant class about zero and I look at its monodromy about C, then that will be non-trivial and I get some conifold vanishing cycle delta by doing that. Okay, so those are the main classes to remember. This is the invariant cycle at zero. This is the um, the conifold cycle, the sort of vanishing cycle at the conifold point C. And now I'm going to choose a Durham section. So a section of the canonical extension over the whole projective line that is nowhere vanishing except it po possibly, well, it has to vanish somewhere. It has to vanish at infinity. Um, and so I only allow it to vanish at infinity. And that completely normalizes it up to scale. And I normalize the scale by insisting that its period against the vanishing cycle at the origin goes to one at zero. So that makes mu unique. And I'm also going to choose the Picard Fuchs operator in a unique way. First, I assume that it's in lowest terms by assuming that the GCDs of these polynomials QJ are, uh, is one. And I, uh, you know, I assume that it kills mu. And finally, I normalize it by saying that Q naught of zero is one. And that makes it unique. And I'll repeatedly write this capital D here to mean T D D T. And then the last assumption in the setup is that the number of conifold points and the degree of L are the same. Uh, so one thing that implies is that there are no apparent singularities in the variation. And when you assume, when you make all these assumptions, finally, at the end of the day, you can write L as um, sum of T to the I, PI of D, 
or pi are polynomials, and the zeroth polynomial is just d to the n plus one. And that's implied by having maximal unit mon monochrome at the origin. Okay, so that's the kind of differential operator um, I'll be using, and we'll, I'll write down some examples later. Let's talk about Betty and Frobenius periods. The Betty periods are just the ones coming from integrating mu over homology cycles. So there exists a unique extension of this invariant cycle epsilon naught to a basis of the homology at P, the Q homology, Q Betty homology, such that N naught sends epsilon J to epsilon J minus one. So N naught is the monodromy logarithm. I'm going to keep a lot of this information here on the slides sort of permanently so that you can refer back to it if you forget a piece of notation. Um, and I also assume, well, no, sorry. I also, as a unique way of fixing this basis, I'm going to impose the criterion that TC minus I kills all of the higher epsilon Js. So once you make this assumption and this assumption, there's a unique choice of basis that satisfies that sort of view under, under the monodromy logarithm, epsilon n goes to epsilon n minus one, goes all the way down to epsilon naught, and everything up above epsilon naught in the tower has trivial monodromy about the confold. All right, next, we just define epsilon j in this font to mean the period of mu over the curly epsilon j's, and those are your log, uh, log to the j of t periods as t goes to zero. And you define psi of t to be the conifold period over the conifold vanishing cycle delta. And that asymptotically looks like t minus c to the n minus one over two as you go to c. Okay, so the Frobenius periods are gonna be c periods rather than q periods. They're not Betty periods, um, but understanding them turns out to be sort of the main point as we'll see in a moment. So we fix a unique choice of some analytic functions on a neighborhood of P by saying, I have a generating series for these things with respect to a new variable S. And I'm going to insist that when I apply the Picard Fuchs operator in T to phi, I get S to the N plus one times T to the S, okay? And that when I apply monodromy about the origin, I get E to the two pi I S times phi. Okay, so one can show using or theorems in ordinary differential equations that this uniquely, um, you know, th there exists a unique so-called Frobenius deformation, which is this thing that is so far formal in S satisfying these two equations. So for example, if n equals three, this just says that phi naught through phi three are solutions to the equation, uh, Picard-Fuchs equation, and that uh, the higher ones satisfy inhomogeneous equations of the form shown. So next, I notice that um, if I multiply by t to the minus s, then by this equation here, I get something t naught invariant. And so then I call that generating, uh, I call the coefficients of that generating series phi analytic sub m. And I can write these phi analytic as power series with expansion coefficients a, m, k. So those are analytic on this disk. And now multiplying by t to the s and expanding the t to the s equals e to the s log t, I find that the phi m's are related to the phi analytics in this way. We also can re, uh, rewrite the infinite sum as a sum in powers of t with coefficients a k of s. So it's sort of a, a just a rearrangement where instead of generating series in s with coefficients analytic functions of t, uh, you get uh, powers of t with coefficients analytic functions of s. Of course, they're formal so far, but they will be analytic functions. Okay, so to show that they're analytic functions uh, and a bunch of other things, one thing we can do is just go back to this equation now, multiply both sides by t to the minus s and apply L to the series phi. And what you can deduce then is that you have s to the n plus one equals this plus stuff that vanishes at t equals zero. 
Setting t equals zero and dividing by s to the n plus one therefore gives us this equation from which you deduce that these aj of zeros and hence the phi analytic j's at zero are all zero except for j equals zero. So in other words, what this is saying is that except for phi naught, which is the period which is holomorphic at zero among the Frobenius ones, all the other Frobenius periods vanish at the origin, all of them. Okay, and what this also shows is this, this a, the first of these AKs, A naught of S is identically one. And finally, phi naught of T, which is this lower phi naught, which I said was the one that's analytic at the origin, um, can be written as this power series expansion. And when I see the AK upper zeros, I'll just omit the upper zero and that will be called AK. And that actually is the same as the zeroth Betty period. So there's sort of one period that's common between these bases, okay? Epsilon naught and phi naught are the same period. And the higher Frobenius periods and the higher Betty periods are different, okay? So a priori, these AKs that I just defined over here are formal in S, but what you can do is by applying the Picard-Fuchs operator to this generating series and observing that you have to get S to the N plus one T to the S from here, you get a recurrence relation on the AM of S's, which together with the fact that A naught of S is one, gives you that the AM are rational functions, okay, and their poles are just on some subset of negative integers. And from that, you can deduce with just a simple complex analysis argument that the Frobenius deformation as defined here is an analytic function on uh, C minus the negative integers in S and um, the universal cover of U in T. Okay, so what can we do with this weird um, analytic function in two variables? we can compute the limiting mixed Hodge structure at the origin. So how do we do that? Well, what is the limiting mixed Hodge structure? There are two ways to think about it. The first is that I can unscrew the limiting Hodge flag um, as the Hodge flag goes into the origin and compute that with respect to the fixed Q Betty basis of homology at my fixed point P. And then the weight filtration is given by uh, subsets of those. So I've sort of illustrated over here, it's kind of too small to see, but the weight filtration is given by subsets of these Q Betty cycles here. On the other hand, what turns out to be better here is to untwist the local system and to just compute the limit of the Hodge flag in the canonical extension. Because these untwisted local system elements give a basis for the canonical extension at zero. And when we do that and set the uh, limiting period matrix to be the change of basis matrix between mu, this is remember the Durham section at t equals zero in the canonical extension and its various gauss manin derivatives also in the canonical extension with respect to this unscrewed Q Betty basis, what we get um, you know, to compute the, the, the coefficients of the change of basis matrix just means to take, say, this guy, evaluate it at zero, and then pair it against one of these. That's the same thing as taking the limit of this unscrewing of the Q Betty period. What that does is it simply removes all log Ts. So it's, it's equivalent to taking your Q Betty period and formally setting log T equal to zero. And that gives you what we'll call epsilon j analytic. And so at the end of the day, we're taking these Q Betty periods, formally setting log t equal to zero, and then evaluating at t equals zero. And that's going to give some interesting numbers. You're supposed to believe that. Okay. Whereas if you do the same thing for the Frobenius periods, we already showed that that gives zero, which are not interesting numbers. Um, so uh, more generally, you can show using the fact that the residue of novel at the origin is this that the full period matrix is just given by shifts of this first column that we found over here. In other words, the omega lim j comma k is just omega lim j minus k comma zero from which you 
know the whole matrix. Okay, so as I said, on the other hand, the Frobenius analytic guys are zero at zero, except for J equals zero. So in essence, omega lim is a change of basis matrix between Vet Betty and Frobenius solutions of L equals zero. And we'll see this more concretely in a moment. Okay, so how do we actually compute? We need to introduce another generating series. And this will be our first theorem now. So consider the fact that if I apply TC minus I, the analytic continuation about the conifold, to solutions of the gauss manin uh, the, Ga of the Fuchs equation, then that is given by just the conifold vanishing cycle period. Okay, but that means if I integrate those periods, in other words, I consider solutions of LD, then the point is because Sol P of L has only one basis element not analytic at C, the same thing will be true for the integrals. And this guy will have rank one. And so now what I can do is dualize that observation and get that Sol P DL has rank one. And since L psi is zero, DL psi is zero. And so that means that TC minus I applied to these solutions is just, you know, complex multiples of the vanishing cycle period. And now you iterate this observation and get the TC minus I applied to Sol P of D to the L times the Picard Fuchs operator are all just the conifold vanishing cycle period. And so that means in particular, if I apply to the higher Frobenius periods, which are solutions to this for some large enough L, then I get these Frobenius constants, right? I get some multiple of Psi. Um, this defines the Frobenius constants of L that I alluded to in the introduction to the talk. And now what we can do is apply TC minus I to the whole generating series of these Frobenius periods and get, of course, the generating series of the Frobenius constants times the vanishing, uh, times the conifold period. Okay, so if I write for the power series expansion of one over this vanishing, uh, this uh, generating function, uh, alpha M, instead of kappa m, then we see there's the relation uh, between the alphas and the kappas here. It's just a Kronecker delta. And the first theorem of this talk, which is sort of buried in the proof of another theorem in Bloch and Vosenko, is that the alpha j's are exactly the first column of this limiting period matrix that we introduced. OK. So let me briefly sketch the proof, just mention the steps involved. From the fact that we are assuming t naught phi is e to the 2 pi i s phi, and n naught is the logarithm of t naught, well, then you get n naught applied to phi is the logarithm of e to the 2 pi i s applied to phi. Now you write this as a generating function in s of the phi j minus ones, and you write this as n not applied to the generating function. And you conclude that n not over 2 pi i applied to phi j gives phi j minus 1. So the Frobenius periods sort of have the same relation to each other under monodromy about the origin as the Cubetti periods. Um, now what we do is we write the Cubetti periods in terms of the Frobenius periods. So that defines some constants, c. You apply n not to both sides several times. And from that, you, after taking analytic parts, conclude that these constants are really nothing but the analytic uh, parts of epsilon L evaluated at zero. Okay. And from that, um, just with some formal nonsense, just starting with this sum here and then recognizing kappa j psi as TC minus I phi j, and then bringing out the TC minus I um, and recognizing this um, from here as epsilon L over power of two pi I, you conclude, um, you conclude that since this is the period of, uh, sorry, since this is the period of delta and this is the period of epsilon L, you conclude that this is true we know that TC minus L applied 
I applied to the epsilon Ls as a chronic or delta times the conifold vanishing cycle. And so at the end of the day, you get chronic or delta equals this sum. And so that basically says that they have this, that these things have the same relation as these things. And so the alpha Js are the CJs. Okay, I mean, that's basically the idea of the proof. It's just formal nonsense. But it's consequential formal nonsense because I can compute the generating series of kappa. And so this second theorem is a theorem from my paper. Um, and it's just a tricky complex analysis argument. So how do you do it? The idea is you, you have to write down the right function. You have to write down this particular difference of the Frobenius deformation evaluated at a fixed s times t to the minus s naught um, minus the fundamental period uh, invariant about zero times some other stuff here. Now you write that as a power series in t to the k just by expanding this. And from that, you observe it's T naught invariant. But you see, its behavior about the conifold point is also clear. Because when you take this about the conifold point, you get kappa times psi. When you take this about the conifold point, you get psi. OK, so that means that you get T to the minus S naught minus C to the minus S naught times this. And so at the end of the day, that's asymptotic to a constant times T minus C to the n plus 1 over 2. But now you remember that Tc minus i is uh, applied to the fundamental period is psi, which is Tc, T minus c to the n minus 1 over 2. So you see, Tc minus i applied to this function has more mild asymptotics than Tc minus i applied to this function. And now you can put that together with a lemma, which is a sort of Talbarian type lemma, um, that says that given a power series with certain properties, Tc minus i, of it asymptotic to T minus c to the w minus 1, or some half integer w, you can say exactly what the asymptotics of the power series coefficients are. And so putting that together with these two things here, we get the AMs are asymptotic to 1 over m to the w plus 1 over 2, and the BMs are asymptotic to 1 over m to the w plus 3 over 2. Um, sorry, I guess w is supposed to be n. Um, and so that means that, that this uh, grows, or th this over a m goes to 0 in the limit. But what does that mean? That means that we can cancel these a m's in this difference. And uh, so we get that this limit here is equal to kappa of s naught over c to the s naught. And so we get this thing at the top. OK, so that's sort of a fairly subtle uh, proof. I'm sorry to blow through it, but I wanted to show you a bit of a taste of it. Because having done this, we get a completely closed form, like completely self-contained proof and calculation of limiting mixed Hodge structures in some cases. Um, and to do that, we use the following corollary. Since the generating series of the alphas is 1 over kappa, you just take 1 over this. Um, and remember that these things can be computed from a recurrence starting with alpha with a naught of s equals 1, where the pj's here are the polynomials arising in the picard fuchs operator. So now let's compute some limiting mixed Hodge structures. If you take d equals 1, then under the assumptions I've made so far in this talk, um, if we additionally assume the unique conifold point is at c equals 1, just to normalize things for simplicity, then the operator has to take this form. Okay, And so from that, you see immediately that the fundamental period is just a hypergeometric function. Okay. And moreover, that makes from the form here of the polynomial P1, P1 here or here, um, from the form of that polynomial, it makes it really easy to say what the recurrence is on the ANs. Okay, and now you iterate the recurrence to get a formula for AM, which is a product of ratios of gamma functions. Okay. 
And if you've ever taken power series expansions of a gamma function, you know that you get zeta values. So again, the Riemann zeta values in those expansions. So um, if we apply this corollary to this sum here, we get the limit of AM of zero, which is what these AMs are, over AM of S. And then you apply Stirling's formula. And Stirling's formula applied to the ratio of this over the same thing at s equals zero gives you this beautiful little product here. Now these lambda j's are rational numbers, assuming we are a motivic variation, which we do. Um, and so if we take a particular set of lambdas, we can um, get our hands dirty and compute the power series expansion and get some concrete numbers. So here's what we get for the mirror quinic variation uh, with Hodge numbers 1, 1, 1, 1. But I mean, you could do this for Hodge numbers 10 ones of weight 9 as well. There's no obstacle to doing that. Uh, you just have to be willing to get your hands sufficiently dirty or have a good computer program. And so anyway, what are these coefficients? These coefficients, as promised, are the zeroth column of omega limb. But they don't look quite right if you've played around with the limit mixed Hodge structure of the mirror clinic. And that's because we need to make a couple normalizations. So we need to renormalize the coefficient now by t goes to t over 5 to the 5. That has the effect of multiplying this generating series here by e to the 5 log 5s. Five so that gets rid of all the log 5s. And then finally, if you use the correct integral basis for the mirror quinic, then that further renormalizes it. And now this looks correct. Okay. You start to see, like, uh, was it the Euler number of the? Uh, you start to see the right invariance for the mirror quinic, at least right in the sense that, like, if, if you know what it's supposed to be from mirror symmetry. Um, but the previous calculations of limiting mixed Hodge structure of the mirror quinic either use some funny business involving mirror symmetry and the, and the gamma class. Um, so you have to, you know, read Iratani's work and, and apply that. Um, and so it's, it doesn't feel very much like a closed argument, and there's quite a bit of mystery there. Or you have to use the ad hoc methods in Candelas de la Osa Green and Parks, which that old article from the 90s, if you examine it closely, as Philip and Mark and I did um, back in 2006, uh, that amounts to a computation of this limiting mixed Hodge structure. But this dispenses with all that. and. Basically, what I've presented so far in this talk is a completely closed form computation um, that yields this result and yields all of the other results that we might know for hypergeometric variations. Now, for non hypergeometric variations, as soon as we take d equals two, things become extremely hard to compute analytically. You need either modular techniques or something else. Um, this is not going to work. Um, uh, typically, uh, a lot of these things are computed in. Uh, I mean, Vasily Goloshev has a nice program in Magma that will do it. Um, but those are not analytic calculations. They're, they're numerical calculations. OK, so I alluded to the Motivic Gamma program at the outset. Um, and my understanding is that there was a meeting in Bure, uh around 2016 um, in which a bunch of people participated. Um, I, I was in St. Louis at the time and, and not there, but um, I think Vasily and Don, as well as Spencer and Masha were there, and maybe Duco Van Straten. And there was a conversation with, with several conjectures presented. And one of the conjectures was that there should be some sort of motivic gamma, uh, theory of motivic gamma functions. Um, and um, and then Spencer and Masha took that and ran with it, and a beautiful paper appeared uh, last year. And um, I'm going to present now sort of the main theorem of that paper that they wrote, which introduces a Mellon transform of the variation of Hodge structure and then relates it to this Frobenius generating series kappa. Okay, so we begin with a rank one connection with differential equation d minus s. Okay, t to the s, that's the name. And now we tensor it with m, our variation of odd structure from geometry. That's the Mellon transform. That's it, m of s. Now what we do is we take a Durand class in that connection, 
which is going to be simply um, M tensor T to the S. And we tensor it with DT over T to get an H1 Duran class. We need to pair that with something in H lower one Betty. And so our H lower one Betty is given by this construction here. So it's a little bit of a mess. You take chains on the base um, and then tensor them together with this Mellon transform on the fibers over the fundamental group of the base, based at P. Okay, and so that's what these expressions mean here in H1U analytic of M of S dual. Okay, so the M of S dual consists of a vertical q Betty cohomology class, a homology class, tensored with an e to the 2 pi i and s, which gives you a choice of branch of this function here. Um, and then the horizontal cycles are, are given by these gamma j's. Okay, so you have to check when you write one of these things down that del applied to it in this, um, in this construction gives zero. Um, but once you have uh, a closed class like that, you can pair it with M in this way. So that's basically just the pairing between H lower one and H upper one. So you can think of it as a, a period of something on the total space, but the something is a bit murky because of the Mellon transform aspect. But right here, for example, these are just fiber wise periods of our section of uh, the original variation um, against uh, QBETI homology cycle. But then we do this, and you see taking the Mellon transform appears there. Okay, so I just want to point out, I don't want to really go through this, that by an easy calculation using integration by parts, and by setting our DRAM section to be our original mu that we started with, the nowhere vanishing section away from infinity, we get this beautiful little recurrence relation on the values of, the, of this gamma function. Um, so these, remember, are the polynomials appearing in the picard fuchs operator. OK, so what does this tell us? Well, that's the same recurrence relation that if you apply the picard fuchs operator to the fundamental period, you get for the coefficients of the fundamental period. OK, so gamma at minus M and A sub N satisfy the same recurrence if gamma is 0 at positive integers. You have to assume that. That will be true for the gamma function that we look at now. Um, and so what that will mean, essentially, is that the gamma values at the negative integers are precisely the A sub Ns. The gamma function interpolates the power series coefficients of your fundamental period. That's its first main property. OK, so the conifold gamma, the one that I want to look at, is something that lives entirely in the sense of this guy, our choice of, of um, H lower 1 Betty cycle, lives entirely over this sort of small neighborhood. It's not quite a neighborhood of the origin. It's a neighborhood of the origin and the conifold point. So this is an analytic object, except in the hypergeometric case, where you can just take it to be P1 minus infinity. Okay, And that presents obstacles when D is bigger than 1. But uh, for the time being, let's just take it and run with it. Basically, this is a period of the Mellon transform on the total space over this sort of analytic sub of P1. And the theorem of Bloch and Vlasenko, their main theorem, as I said, is that kappa of s, and this is this is a form of their main theorem that is in my article. I made it, I kind of tightened it up and made it more precise in the particular case that I'm studying. Uh, I wanted to get all of these constants uh, exactly right. Um, so kappa of s is up to multiplication by some stuff that's not particularly interesting or non-trivial, uh, just this conifold gamma. OK, so what does this mean for us? This means that, uh, first of all, the conifold gamma is 0 at positive integers, simply because if you flip this upside down, that function is 0 at positive integers, and you know kappa of s is analytic at the positive integers. And so that means, indeed, gamma, conifold gamma interpolates the power series coefficients of the fundamental period. And so kappa of s looks like this at the negative integers. The next thing. So here I'm just recording what we already have. 
The next thing it tells you is that after acute change of basis, um, uh, on the Cubetti basis, compatible with the weight filtration, the zeroth column of the limiting period matrix is expressible in terms of derivatives of the conifold gamma at the origin. Okay, this is extremely important because now one can write down um, a motive that a mixed motive that has these as its periods. So sort of one of the holy grails that uh, Philip and Mark and I were obsessed with when we wrote that paper was there should be a limiting motive, not just a formal construction like exists in many papers. There are several constructions of so-called limiting motives, but you want something that you can actually apply a Hodge realization functor to, so to speak, and get something that is provably the limiting mixed Hodge structure. This does that in the hypergeometric case, okay? Uh, in the non-hypergeometric case, it gives you like a, a you know, some mixed motive, some of whose periods are the limiting periods. So that's not quite exciting or good enough. But for the hypergeometric case, it gives you this thing, this sought object. So consider the following family of mixed motives. Just the fibers are going to be the fibers of my original family of Calaviaus or whatever they were, cross GM relative one comma T raised to the nth power, okay? Now, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take Sn invariance of that and take IH1 of the result over GM, okay? When I do that, I get a submotive of this big motive here of rank N plus one with MHS periods exactly given by this, okay? That's a calculation you can do. And so you get that the limiting mixed Hodge structure at zero, here I'm just using Saito's notation for the limiting mixed Hodge structure, is isomorphic as Q mixed Hodge structure to this mode, to the Hodge realization of this mode. Okay, so that is a limiting motive for your money in the D equals one case. Uh, D greater than one case is, is still open. Um, so next, unipotent extensions. Um, I want to talk about what the higher alpha m's and higher Frobenius constants, dual to them, so to speak, mean. All right. So I fix um, a positive integer, and I consider the following extension of connections. Okay. So I have my original connection m that I've been considering as a variation all along. Now I'm going to extend it by this, which is just the thing with the, the formal D module with Picard Fuchs operator D to the L. Okay. And the thing that sits in between them is D to the L, L. Okay. So um, uh, I can take one in here that maps to one in here. And I can say that one corresponds to some element in here. This is just a change in notation, really. And then that element in here goes to my Durham section in M. But how do I know this is compatible with mixed Hodge theory at all? I don't. So you need a theorem. And Bloch and Blasenko prove part of this theorem. And th there's a really important uniqueness part to this theorem, which is my contribution, which then together with a construction I do, gives a motivic interpretation of E1 and we'll give a motivic interpretation in some uh, follow-up work I'm doing with Vasily Golenshev for all L. So EL restricted to the disk punctured about the origin underlies a Q variation of mixed Hodge structure, which is the unique one on that punctured disk with underlying D module, the one here, and satisfying several things. First, we have to have that this guy generates the top Hodge line. We have to have that um, if you look at, if you dualize and you send epsilon naught, this Q Betty cycle in here, that it goes to your choice of, of uh, Q local system um, on E. And you also need to assume that E extends to that sort of double punctured neighborhood of, of zero and C, and that E has the Hodge numbers shown here. Okay, this is P and Q. Okay, so it's a variation of mixed Hodge structure over the punctured disk about the origin, whose local system continues about C. 
okay, and, and remain the, the mononomy about that remains Q rational. But once you fix this, so that's already unique, it also satisfies the following things, you know, uh, that this is a mixed hodgemorphism, that the variation about the conifold point, um, it, that that monodromy is contained in the monodromy of this about the conifold point. And finally, that the periods of the limiting mixed Hodge structure of this at the origin, which is Hodge Tate, are the higher inverse Frobenius constants. So alpha naught up through alpha n extended to alpha n plus L. So it turns out there is a plentiful source of such variations of mixed Hodge structure in the case L equals one. So take a Laurent polynomial, okay? With reflexive Newton polytopes so that I get a family of Calabi Yau's cut out by its level sets. That's all this says. I'm looking at its level sets and doing some crepit resolution of its level sets. And that gives me a smooth family of Calabi Yau n folds over some Zariski open in, in P1. And I take these canonical residue forms, and those give me my Durham section. You can show, you, you, I mean, even 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 if these conifold points were much worse, you can you can prove that, that these give exactly the canonical section of the uh, canonical extension that I referred to before. And now take the constants in those Laurent polynomial of powers, the powers of that. These are the constant terms. Those are your coefficients of your fundamental periods, and those are the things that the gamma function interpolates. And I assume that Hn of xt has a 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 subvariation of Hodge structure. And now I suppose also that phi is tempered. That means that this canonical sort of um, Har motivic cohomology class, which kind of generalizes the Har form on gm to the n, when you pull it back under sort of, there's a canonical uh, sort of a easy to see map from x minus x naught to gm to the n. You pull it back to there um, and you want it to extend to a motivic cohomology class there. Sorry, I didn't say that quite right. It's, it's an open set in this, which maps to gm to the n. And then you want it to extend across the, the gaps of the fibers. So for example, Minkowski polynomials are a common source of Laurent polynomials that satisfy this. Um, and then we get an extension of variations of mixed Hodge structure over U coming from geometry associated to the section Abel Jacobi of this construction restricted to fibers. That gives a section of these generalized intermediate Jacobians. And the theorem um, that's stated in our paper is that uh, if you dualize um, and shift this construction, then you get this first block Flasenko extension. And so that means the periods of this geometrically defined uh, extension are given by the first few Frobenius constants and then this additional one, which was not in the limiting mixed Hodge structure of the pure variation. Okay. So just to, to give a quick example, you take this Laurent polynomial and you can prove kappa naught equals one, kappa one equals zero, kappa two is minus two zeta of two, and kappa three is 17 six zeta of three. And you can do that with modular techniques. Um, and and Goloshev and Zagir do that in their paper by studying the example attached to the variety, the Vanna variety V12. And this is also a form of the Boykers Peters family of K3 surfaces associated to Aperi's irrationality proof for zeta of three. And there are many other similar examples. Okay. So I want to conclude with a bit on Apiri constants, which are some other arithmetically interesting constants that can be defined from the Picard-Fuchs equation, which are different from the Frobenius constants. And they arise from asking the question, not to what the higher Frobenius constants mean, but what do the values of the Frobenius generating series at positive integers mean, okay? So, so far, just in the S line, we have been looking at the values at negative integers of the motivic gamma and the power series coefficients of the motivic gamma at the origin. And now the question is, what is its behavior at positive integers? So the amazing thing about this function, either gamma or, or kappa, 
is that all this information is packed into this one object. So the, the, the coefficients of the fundamental period, these AMs, the, the uh, extension information in the limiting mixed Todd structure in the origin for the variation in all these unipotent extensions at the origin, and then at the positive integers, there's going to be some interesting other information. Okay, so here is another theorem from my paper. Um, the paper I'm talking about is unipotent extensions and differential equations. That's the title of the paper. Um, let VL of T be the unique solution to this inhomogeneous Picard Fuchs equation with a polynomial on the right hand side, just a power of T times a constant. So I want it to be the unique solution to that inhomogeneous equation, which is analytic at zero and the conifold point C. Okay, then it turns out that the value of that inhomogeneous solution at the origin is kappa evaluated at the positive integer L. And those are what we call the Apiary constants of L. So consider first that VL of T defined by this is TC invariant. Why? Because continuing phi naught about C gives you psi and continuing this about C by definition gives you kappa times psi. Okay. So they cancel. So um, I guess I reversed it here. So now you just have a power series expansion for that, which just comes from the formulas we wrote down for these earlier. And you see it's also analytic at 0. So it's analytic at 0 and at c. And you can write down what these BLKs are. They're these constants. And because the 0th constant the zeroth k equals zero bk is zero. That means that when you evaluate this at the origin, you just get kappa of L times a zero, which is kappa of L. All right, now you check that this satisfies this inhomogeneous equation, which it does because the Picard Fuchs operator kills phi naught. So it's just the Picard Fuchs operator applied to the Frobenius deformation evaluated at L, and that gives you this. And moreover, any other solution to this inhomogeneous equation involves adding a copy of the fundamental period, and that is not TC invariant. Okay, and so you get that this is the unique solution uh, analytic at both zero and C. Okay, so first observe that the recurrence on the conifold gamma induces one on the kappa function by Bloch and Blasenko's theorem, which makes kappa of d, kappa of d plus one, etc., completely determined by the first handful of values of kappa and positive integers. So these are the ones that we actually care about. Those are the Apiary constants. So for d equals two, there's exactly one of these things, and we should be able to figure out what it means. So the second remark is just by way of explanation of this term apiary constants. Why do I call it that? Well, these are two functions with monodromy at C. If you take this difference, it does not have monodromy at C. And so these power series coefficients grow much less rapidly than these power series coefficients. And so if I divide by this, I get that the limit of the ratio of these two power series coefficients is kappa of L. Okay, that's exactly what happens in Apiary's irrationality proof for zeta of three, and that's why we call this an Apiary constant. Notice this is different from 17.6 zeta of three, which was kappa sub three. So these are, and, and typically they're much more different than that. All right, so let me conclude with one more theorem. If M arises from a tempered Laurent polynomial phi, as in the previous section, and D equals two, what is kappa of one? Okay, in this case, there exists some positive integer constrained in here, such that IH1 of M, our original variation, over P1 minus zero is a Tate object, Q of minus B, for that integer. And there exists an admissible normal function with coefficients in M of P that is non-singular away from infinity. And by M of P, I mean M twisted by P. Now, what I do is I take a lift of this admissible normal function, right, which I can regard as a section of a family of generalized intermediate Jacobians. So I can lift it to just a section of M, which is multi-valued. But it can be chosen so that it's single valued over P1 minus a cut going from C2 out to infinity. So it's single valued on here. 
And now what I do is I pair, um, I pair that lift to cohomology with this section mu of cohomology. And that gives me a single valued analytic function on P1 minus this cut. Then there exists some algebraic number such that L applied to this truncated normal function, as we call it, um, gives minus theta t. And then kappa of one is v naught v of zero divided by this theta. Okay, so basically kappa of one is the value of this normal function at the origin. Okay, and this is this is you know this is proved in the article. I'm out of time to sketch the proof, but let me um, state one consequence. According to the Balance and Hodge conjecture, v should arise from a cycle in motivic cohomology of the total space minus the fiber at infinity. And if you could construct this cycle, then kappa of one is obtained by evaluating its Abel Jacobi of its restriction to the fiber at zero, which is this very degenerate fiber, against the limit of the Durham section at zero. And that gives a way to compute kappa of one. And in the follow-up paper uh, I wrote with uh, Tokyo Sasaki, and Vasily Goloshev. We work this out in several cases. Uh, for families of K3 surfaces mirror to five Fano threefolds, we actually effectively compute kappa of one using this um, formula. And you have to construct cycles in here and, and find their regulators. To accumulate evidence for an arithmetic mirror symmetry conjecture, which I believe Tokyo will um, state in his talk tomorrow, or at least he'll sort of uh, talk around this, uh, this idea. Um, and so finally, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Matt. And the floor is open for questions. Matt, are there other results like the operary one that come out of this? I, you know, I, it sounded as though there were, but I couldn't quite isolate them in what you were saying. Well, there are not uh, so far new irrationality proofs, if that's what you mean coming out of this, but the, the, the reinterpretation of that operary proof as computing, um, computing these a priori constants of Fano varieties, which is something that's that's defined in terms of, uh, you, you construct the quantum connection on a Fano uh, variety and look at asymptotics of solutions to that. Um, and I mean, that's an irregular differential equation and so forth. So the uh, sort of a generalized mixed version of the gamma conjecture um, that includes the old gamma conjecture from like 2015 is that those a priori constants on the A model side should be mirror to special values of higher normal functions of the origin. And so that's, that's what you can write. I mean, that, that's the, the sense in which the a priori story generalizes. Um, so you get, you get many computations of these, um, these things that I talked about at the end. And then you can check that they're the same as the ones computed for the quantum differential equation. So you can get that check. Um, and in some sense, this theorem I stated at the end can be can be thought of as a, an up to balance and Hodge conjecture proof of that for d equals two. Okay. This was a mystery from like Vasily's paper in in two thousand nine, which he called deresonating a tape period, because he had this very very non motivic calculation of some of the upper e constants, and he didn't believe that they were motivic, and and this proves that they are. So if there are no other questions or comments, uh, I'd like to thank Matt and we'll reconvene at two o'clock uh, this afternoon.